Live NFL trivia every Tuesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge and have a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. The Trap Game is a tale as old as time. Throughout the history of the NFL, there have been plenty of trap games where one team is clearly superior to the other on paper and has a big game coming up, so they completely ignore the game against their inferior opponent. They look past them, and they don't take them seriously or they have their mind elsewhere. Then they proceed to lose the game, with the other team pulling off the upset. We saw this in 1990, when the undefeated San Francisco 49ers were probably looking ahead to their Monday Night Football matchup against the undefeated New York Giants, only to lose to the 3-7 Los Angeles Rams by double figures the week before. We've seen this happen so many times with Mike Tomlin's Pittsburgh Steelers in recent years that I've lost count. If I listed every trap game in the history of the NFL, we would be here until the season started. But when looking at the history of the Raiders franchise, there is one particular trap game that stands out from the rest. There is one game where the players bought massively into their own hype, and spoke about an opponent other than the one they were playing on Sunday, and it came back to cost them in a big way. In 1974, the Oakland Raiders lost a game that on paper, they had absolutely no business of losing. And this is the story behind the biggest trap game in Raiders history. Before I talk about the game itself, we need some context leading up to the game, because it will help us to understand how good the Raiders were that season, and why they fell into that trap in the first place. In the second half of the 1960s and the first half of the 1970s, there was a stretch where you could just pencil Oakland in as the champion of their division, whether it was the AFC West or the AFL West. Entering 1974, the team had finished with a winning record each year since 1965, and had won the division in six of the past seven seasons. After a 9-4-1 campaign in 1973, they were the heavy favorites to repeat as division champions in 1974. The Broncos had never been anything better than mediocre in the history of their franchise. The Chargers were one of the worst teams in football, and the once dominant Chiefs seemed to be on the decline. Many people would have been stunned if Oakland didn't finish that 1974 season as division champions. And sure enough, they positioned themselves incredibly nicely to prove the experts right and make it back to the postseason. After a shocking 21-20 loss to the Buffalo Bills on Monday Night Football to open up the season, Oakland bounced back by rattling off eight straight wins. Among the performances in that stretch included a shutout victory on the road against the Pittsburgh Steelers, a win against the Cleveland Browns where the defense forced six turnovers, and a dominating win against the Detroit Lions where the Raiders picked up 284 rushing yards and averaged close to seven yards per carry. If you said after nine weeks that the Raiders were the best team in football, I don't think anyone would have argued with you too much on that statement. Through nine weeks, they sat at 8-1, which was the best record in all of football. Their offense, led by Pro Bowl and first-team All-Pro quarterback Ken Stabler, a great receiving duo featuring Pro Bowler Fred Belitnikoff and arguably the best receiver in pro football in Cliff Branch, a balanced rushing attack led by Marv Hubbard and Clarence Davis, and an offensive line with three future Hall of Famers on it in Art Shell, Gene Upshaw, and Jim Otto, had scored 246 points, which was the most in the NFL, and came out to an average of over 27 points per game. The defense had allowed just 143 points all season, which was the third best total in the AFC. They had the best point differential in football by a healthy margin at plus 103, and entering Week 10, they were on the verge of clinching the entire division. Perhaps no statistic exhibits the dominance of the Raiders, as well as their superiority over their three division rivals, better than this one. By the time November 18th had passed, the Raiders could have clinched the AFC West. To clinch the division two weeks before Thanksgiving is unbelievable. However, that's a position that the Raiders found themselves in through nine weeks. Entering Week 10, the Raiders were 8-1, with the Broncos in second place at 4-4-1, and the Chiefs and Chargers tied at the bottom at 3-6. With only 14 games in the season, if the Raiders won their matchup, then they could eliminate the Chiefs and the Chargers entirely. Then if the Broncos lost their game against the Chiefs the following day on Monday Night Football, the Raiders would have a 4.5 game lead on the Broncos with 4 to play thereby clinching the division in the middle of November. The first part of this equation was beating the San Diego Chargers. The first time these teams met back in Week 5, the Chargers gave the Raiders a heck of a fight, leading 10-7 after three quarters. However, the Raiders would prevail after Bob Moore caught a four-yard touchdown pass from Ken Stabler to win it 14-10. Once again, this would be a close matchup between the two California division rivals. And once again, just like last time, the Raiders would prevail. Oakland would strike first on a 60-yard touchdown pass from Stabler to Cliff Branch, and would never relinquish the lead after that. Oakland won the game 17-10, thanks to a defense that held Dan Fouts in the Charger passing game to just 144 net passing yards, and an offensive line that kept Stabler upright all day long, as he never took a sack. Part 1 done. Now came the second part of the equation. 
On Monday Night Football, the other two AFC West teams would square off at Mile High Stadium. If the Chiefs won, then the Broncos would be mathematically eliminated from the division title, giving Oakland its third straight division title and its seventh division title in eight years. And in an incredibly high-scoring affair, that's exactly what happened. Even though the Broncos had 532 yards of total offense, and even though Broncos quarterback Charlie Johnson threw for 445 yards, which was the most yards of his 14-year career at that point, and the first time in over a decade he had crossed the 400-yard mark, it was still not enough, as the Chiefs won at 42-34. Part 2 done. Just like that, the Raiders won the division title. All they had to do now was finish out the season. But as John Madden and the fans would find out, that would seem to be a massive problem. After winning nine straight games, you could get the sense that Oakland was starting to buy into their own hype just a bit. The media was hyping them up, and even opponents were hyping them up, with Lions quarterback Bill Munson saying there isn't any doubt about it. The way they're playing, they're going to the Super Bowl. One Raider who may have flown a bit too close to the sun was Ken Stabler, who said, I think we smell something good. This just might be our year. The Raiders were definitely looking ahead a bit. Still, despite the exciting news about the division title, Head coach John Madden said that the team wasn't going to slack off at all. He said he didn't think there would be any letdown, that the team would still play incredibly hard, and that outside of resting injured players and not taking chances on guys that may be hurt, that this division title announcement changed absolutely nothing. Good message for the head coach to have, not that you'd expect anything less from Madden. Unfortunately, it seemed like the players didn't get the memo. Leading up to the game, Raiders linebacker Phil Villapiano said just about the most blatant thing to indicate that you don't care about your upcoming opponent, and that you're looking ahead to future teams on the schedule. Because prior to their Week 11 game against the Denver Broncos, he said, I can't wait for Miami. Last time I checked, the Broncos don't play in Miami. The Raiders didn't even have the Dolphins on the schedule yet. Villapiano was looking ahead a month to not even a confirmed playoff opponent, but just a potential one. Now you might be wondering why he said Miami as if he knew for sure that the Raiders would play the Dolphins in the postseason. Now back in 1974, the NFL had a really weird system where instead of seeing the teams by record, the playoff matchups were determined on a rotating basis. This led to some really weird scenarios, such as in 1972, when the Miami Dolphins went undefeated and yet had to play the AFC Championship on the road in Pittsburgh. Thank goodness they got rid of that system. However, in 1974, the AFC West winner was scheduled to take on the AFC East winner in the divisional round. The Dolphins hadn't even clinched the AFC East yet, and they were only up by a game on the Buffalo Bills with four to play, so that was still up in the air. However, Villapiano, as well as a few other Raiders, were looking to that potential matchup instead of focusing on the game at hand against the Broncos. That won't come back to bite them in any way, right? On paper, this was absolutely a game that the Raiders should have won. The Raiders were the more talented team. Earlier in the season, Oakland won 28-17 jumping onto an early 14-0 lead and never looking back, with Ken Stabler throwing four touchdown passes and no interceptions for a pass rating of 141.9. The Broncos had dropped three of their last four games and had a pretty porous defense, as their 219 points allowed through 10 weeks was the fourth most in all of football out of 26 teams. Every publication I saw had the Raiders winning this game, with a majority of them having them winning it by multiple possessions, especially with the Raiders having won nine straight, Playing this one at home in a venue they hadn't lost in all year and had won eight straight games in, and playing this one with an extra day of rest since the Broncos were playing on a Monday night the week before, this should be a walk in the park. However, as you can probably guess based on the title of this video, it was anything but that. This was your classic trap game. Stabler, who was pretty much perfect in the first meeting, struggled in this one, throwing three interceptions. Denver's ground game got going in a big way, as the team picked up 292 rushing yards and over six yards per carry. Oakland's defense, which had forced multiple turnovers in seven of their last eight games, could only force one turnover in this game. And after John Keyworth punched in from 30 yards out in the first quarter to give Denver a 7-0 lead, the Broncos never trailed at any point. Denver led it 20-10 after three quarters, and despite a late touchdown by Stabler to Blitnikoff in the fourth quarter to guide to a more respectable gap, it was not enough, as the Broncos won it 20-17. Just to give you some more perspective on how shocking this one was, the Raiders winning over the Broncos always seemed to be a formality. The Raiders swept the season series in 1973. From 1963 until this game, the Raiders had played the Broncos 23 times. The Broncos won a grand total of one of those games. That's it. Yet on this day in 1974, somehow, the Raiders completely overlooked the Broncos, and the Broncos made them pay for it. And after the game, 
The talk seemed to be focused on what a lot of people saw coming, just based on the quotes and attitude beforehand. This was a trap game. Broncos head coach John Ralston spoke afterwards and acknowledged that even though his team played well, that the Raiders definitely made the mistake at looking past them. As he said, we had the feeling that maybe we caught a team that had won the championship and was a little flat. That seemed to be an accurate assessment just based off of everything said leading up to the game. And it's safe to say that this game served as a major wake-up call to the Raiders going forward. Some Raiders called this loss at the time of blessing in disguise, and that it was necessary because the team was getting a bit overconfident. Sure enough, the Raiders ended the season on a three-game winning streak. They wouldn't let it happen again. They beat the Patriots by three possessions the following week. They went on the road to Arrowhead Stadium and beat the Chiefs in a low-scoring affair, and then ended the regular season in a Saturday primetime game with a win against the always formidable Dallas Cowboys. When the season ended, the Raiders finished with a record of 12-2, which was the team's best record since the merger. And sure enough, Villapiano would get his wish and would get to play Miami. You probably know how that one turned out. The Raiders won 28-26 in the famous Sea of Hands game, when Ken Stabler hit Clarence Davis on an 8-yard touchdown pass. Oakland would lose the following week to the Pittsburgh Steelers in the AFC Championship in what would be another installment in what was quickly becoming one of the best rivalries in all of football. Did this loss to the Broncos make a difference in the grand scheme of things? Probably not. Again, the Raiders had clinched the division, and this game had no implication on seeding whatsoever, since the playoff system was all sorts of messed up back in the early 70s. But the loss showed an important lesson that more than half a century later, is still felt by players and coaches and fans everywhere. On any given Sunday, any team can win. You can never afford to look ahead and look past an opponent. If you do, you wind up like the 1974 Raiders, who fell victim to an easy opponent on paper because they looked way too far ahead in their non-existent schedule. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com, and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot, and be sure to check out Twitch every Monday and Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for a chance to play NFL Trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at jaguar9, and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See so how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.